Okay, well, uh, welcome again to uh, Freddy Cachado, who uh, is, this is second lecture, and his title is there on the board, Unexpected Geometric Structures and Particle Interactions. All right, interactions. thank you very much. So, as you notice, I decided to change the title, but I told you yesterday already that that was the title I intended. So I hope that those of you who came yesterday uh, would agree that the unexpected combinatorial structures was, uh, was a good title for the talk yesterday. And today I'm going to try to convince you that there is also some unexpected geometric structure. So in what? So for those who were not here yesterday, the object we want to study is known as scattering amplitude. And if you're given a collider, like the LHC, where we accelerate protons nearly the near to the speed of light and make them collide, we will have a region where particles interact. And we're supposed to make predictions about what happens in those regions. And the way we do it is by computing this object known as scattering amplitudes. So the main tool we have, as we discussed yesterday, the standard approach is to use quantum field theory. And yesterday, I gave you the definition of a field. Actually, I told you the most basic kind of fields that you can imagine, which are maps from one to, from this space to the reals. So there is a small difference between what I'm doing today and what I did yesterday. As you notice, now I have promoted the dimensionality of space-time to be any. Yesterday, we dealt with d equals to 3, sorry, d equals to 4, which is our space-time dimension. I'll try to give you some motivation for why we'd be interesting to move to general dimensions later. We also discussed that a theory meant the definition of a Lagrangian, which is a function of the fields and its derivatives. And from here, we construct an axiom functional from which we are supposed to compute these scattering amplitudes. OK. Very good. So let me give you the motivation for why we want to do d greater than 4, or equal to 4, it doesn't matter. So we can do any dimensionality. So what's the motivation? Well, the motivation, of course, there is the, the simple motivation that it would be mathematically interesting to construct a theory that works in any number of dimensions. But physically, we also have a string theory as a prime motivator. The string theory lives in 10 dimensions, but it also has objects called D-brains that live, that have different space-time dimensionalities. There is also some sort of the parent or the mother of a string theory, which you call M-theory, which lives in 11 dimensions. And this one has an interesting theory or an interesting object, which is called an m 5 brain. And this is an object that has six space-time dimensions. And it's one of the most mysterious objects in string theory. In fact, if you try to write down the effective action or a theory that describes what's happening on, on the space defined by this mysterious object, some people say that the M stands for mysterious, right? So if you try to write down the theory for this M5 ring, you will find that it's impossible to construct anything that is Lorentz invariant or that is invariant under the natural set of symmetries. But recently, using the techniques that I'm going to explain today, so in November of last year, um, I won't be able to spell the names. Heidemann, Schwartz, and when were able to construct all 
scattering amplitudes for this theorem. For any number of external states, even though they didn't know what the theory looks like. So I'll try to convince you today that there are ways of constructing a scattering amplitudes without even knowing what the Lagrangian is. Okay. So that's the goal today. And for that, I'm going to restrict myself literally to this case. It's this case where the field is called a scalar theory. So this won't cover the M5 frame theory, but at least it will motivate you to go ahead and try to read more and, and get to the point where you can understand how this theory was constructed. OK. So for our scalars, Imagine that you have your friend, your higher dimensional experimentalist, and you ask your experimentalist, well, what's the data that you have to give me in order for me to compute or to understand what's going to happen in this scattering process? So your experiment, higher dimensional experimentalist friend, who is going to give you what happens for these scalar fields, will give you the following data. So we're going to be considering the scattering, the process where m particles scatter. So your friend will give you a matrix, an m by m matrix of real numbers. It turns out that this matrix will have zeros in the diagonal, and it will be symmetric. So this is the data. So Kn is just a matrix with real numbers. The matrix is symmetric, and it has zeros in the diagonal. So that's all what your experimentalist friend will give you. And from that data, you're supposed to compute the predictions of the theory. All right. Well, it turns out that here, this matrix also has to satisfy something else. It has to satisfy that the sum of rows is zero. So let me write the conditions that this matrix satisfies. So in other words, this matrix, in order to correspond to a physical object, it has to satisfy this condition. Okay. So what's the dimension of the space of kinematic invariance that you can have? What's the dimension from which your experimentalist friend can pick a point and give you data in order to describe the scattering process? Well, let's just count. So the dimensionality of this space, which I'm going to call Kn, is nothing but the dimension of the space of symmetric matrices minus the condition that the diagonals are zero minus the condition that the sums of rows is equal to zero. And that gives me n times n minus 3 over 2. Okay? So the condition that the sum of the rows, or equivalently the sum of the columns, is equal to zero is the condition that imposes translation invariance. For those of you who were here yesterday, I told you that the scattering amplitudes are not functions, they are distributions localized on the support where the sum of the momenta has to vanish. But all that condition boils down to simply saying that you are interested in the space of matrices, n by n matrices that satisfy these conditions. All right. Now, matrices that do this appear very often. Of course, if the entries are integers, they appear very often in graph theory matrices where the sum of the rows or the and the columns are up to zero. And in graph theory, 
is, is very common to define. So here I'm going to write a small aside. It's very common to define the determinant of this object. Of course, the determinant will be 0. But it's very common to define the determinant of the object obtained, or the submetrix obtained by removing the i row and the j column. And this determinant happens to be independent of the choice of i and j. And it's an invariant of this matrix. So I'm going to call it the determinant prime of this matrix, k. And it's defined as the determinant of the submatrix obtained by deleting any row and any column. And the value is a simple exercise to show that it doesn't depend on the choice that I make. OK? Very good. Next. Our scattering amplitude after you remove the delta function that we talked about yesterday, it's now going to be a function of the entries of this matrix. But what are the requirements? On F. So from the 60s, people became interested, or people developed a conjecture or a principle. And the principle was that everything in nature, or at least at this fundamental level, should be analytic functions of the data. So I'm not going to contradict them, and I'm going to take f to be an analytic function of this data. So analytic would mean that it only depends holomorphically on this data. Even though I took it to be real, I'll promote them to be complex for the time being. And I'll allow this function to only depend on this data, on the holomorphic part. Now, this function could have poles and branch cuts. But if I want to finish on time, I have to restrict myself only to poles. Okay? So I'm going to assume that this function only has poles, and therefore, f is a rational function. of the entries of the matrix. Now, if it only has poles, if I tell you where the poles are, and I tell you the residues, we have a good chance at determining what the function is. So where are the poles? I'm only going to allow simple poles. And the simple poles will be located at the following locations. Sorry, ah, of course. So the simple poles will happen when, for any, for any subset, I'm going to call the subset E. It's a very long standard notation for a subset, but you will see why I'm calling it E at some point in the talk. So for any subset, I don't mean that it belongs to this. It's a subset of, of this, mm -hmm. such that it has more than two elements. You can define the sum over all the elements in the matrix, such that A and B both belong to the set E. And this combination I'm going to call P of the subset. Now, whenever p of the subset is equal to 0, we should have a pole. Okay. It's also a simple exercise to show that this object happens to agree with p of the complement. If these conditions are satisfied, then p of e agrees with p of the complement. So every time there is a pole at P of E, of course, it also happens that the sum, this particular sum for the complement also vanishes. All right. And given that, that this is a blackboard talk, you are supposed to ask questions at any point. Feel free. 
because this part of the, of the lecture series is supposed to be more informal. So you're allowed to ask questions at any moment. Now, the last condition on our object F is the following. So, it's about the residues at the poles. So, in order to describe what the residues are supposed to be, what I'm going to tell you is the following. Let's study the behavior of this matrix K when we are sitting near one of these poles. So without loss of generality, let me assume that the set E happens to be the first M labels in the matrix. So let me assume that E happens to be the set 1, 2, up to M. In other words, the condition is imposed on the first M labels of this matrix and the, on this block but also on the complement, on the M minus M layers here and here. Mm -hmm. So what happens when I impose that the sum of every one in this triangular corner vanish? Well, what happens is the following. We can take this matrix and draw it here. So we now have a K, an M by M matrix where the sum of all these elements is equal to zero. And that means that I can complete this matrix into a slightly larger matrix that is now M plus one by M plus one. And how would I complete it? I want to complete it so that this is an element of the physical set of data that an experimentalist would give me. And how do I do that? Well, these entries are all very easy to set because I need the sum of the columns to be zero. So the sum of everything here has to be zero. So I can freely choose this number to be minus the sum of these numbers. Here, and this one to be minus the sum of these numbers. So everything works very well, and even these ones will be determined. But now, there is the last condition. I have to impose that the sum of all these numbers, or equivalently, the sum of all these numbers is equal to zero as well, in order to have physical data. But the sum of all the numbers of this form here happens to be nothing but PE. So if I'm sitting on the pole where PE is equal to zero, this matrix belongs to the space of kinematic data for n plus 1 particles. Of course, the whole story goes through for the bottom part. And we have, again, something that can be extended. And now we have m minus m plus 1. Now I can tell you what the function f has to do what the residue is at the poles. So the residue of F at the pole PE is equal to zero has to be equal to F evaluated on the kinematic data for M plus one particles times F on the kinematic data for M minus M plus one particles. So we have this next structure that has to happen for these scattering amplitudes. Now, this is very exciting because you would think that this structure in the space of matrices would be something that mathematically would correspond to a nice hop. But there is a problem with that picture. The problem is that if I take this, recall what the dimensionality of the space is. The space of matrices. <coughs> The dimensionality of this space is m times m minus 3 over 2. And the dimensionality of these two spaces is very, very small. 
So if we add up this, the dimensionality of these two spaces, we get a subspace that is very small compared to this. And we have imposed only one condition. So it wouldn't be nice if we could find a mathematical space where when we separate the space by imposing a single condition, we could go down in co-dimension only one step. So if we could find a subspace of this mathematical space that has co-dimension one when we impose only one condition. This space of matrices clearly doesn't do it. So the claim I'm going to make is that this space is not the nicest space, even though it's the one that experimentalists will give you. This is not the space that you want to be using to do quantum field theory or to compute your scattering amplitude. So what is the space? So what do we want? We want a space where, after imposing one condition, we go to a codimension one boundary. So I'll tell you what the answer is. And I'm sure many of you uh, know what the answer is. Well, there, there probably are many, many possibilities. But this is one possibility. It happens to be the modular space of a stable genus zero curves with n mark points. And usually denoted like this. OK, it sounds complicated if you have never heard of it. But if you came to the talk yesterday, you already saw an example. So this is nothing but our celestial sphere. That we discussed yesterday. So that's an example. Well, it's not an example of the model space, it's an example of a point in this space. So the celestial sphere, or in other words, this model space, is the space of CP1s, or celestial spheres, if you came to the talk yesterday, with n stars, or n mark points on the sphere. And remember from yesterday's lecture, if you apply an SL to C transformation, you get something that looks different to the observer, but physically is the same. So this sphere and any other sphere related by an SL to C transformation give rise to the same point in this space. So we can use a stereographic projection to explicitly write down what this thing looks like. So if you use a stereographic projection for this sphere, we can give names to the location of the mark points, or a name to where you found the stars. So we can say that this position is a complex number that I'm going to call sigma 1. This position is sigma 2 sigma 3 up to sigma n. And SL2C sends sigma to this new collection of sigmas, where the determinant of this matrix is restricted to B1. Now, using SL2C, we can fix any of three of these mark points to any values we want, because we have three parameters, three free parameters. So that means that this dimension of this space, which naively is n-dimensional, because you would think that you have the n points to play around, so it would be n dimensions, the space of all possible spheres that you can draw. Instead, the dimension of this space is n minus 3. OK? So now let's see that it does the job that I want. So 
So, our space, what kind of singularities could it have? Okay, so what are the singularities that this space can have? Well, it turns out that a nice way of describing these singularities is as follows. Take your sphere and draw any big circle on the sphere that separates the mark points into two sets. So it's starting to sound like the picture that I had before, right? And now squeeze that to a point. So take a set which by chance I'm going to call E. Okay. So this is again a subset of the mark points. And let those points be here, and the other points be on the other side. Draw a circle that separates them, and squeeze the circle, or the belt, all the way to a point, and these two spheres two spheres will appear, where E will be on one side and E bar will be on the other side. Okay. So, after this procedure, I have created a new mark point for this sphere and a new mark point for this sphere. Remember, the whole motivation for doing this is that I want a space such that if I impose a single condition, I go to a codimension one singularity. So let's count the dimensions. So the dimension of the total space was m minus 3. What's the dimension of this? Well, it would be the dimension of this plus the dimension of this. The dimension of this will be the number of elements in this sphere, which is m plus 1 minus 3. So I'm just applying the same formula to this sphere. The plus 1 comes from the node, from the, from, from the node, from the new, from the new mark point. And on this side, I have m minus m, which is the number of elements in E, in the complement of E, plus 1, minus 3. And now you take this complicated thing, you put it in Mathematica to simplify, and you get m minus 3, minus 1, which is exactly this dimensionality, minus 1. It doesn't work. If it doesn't work, don't tell me. <laughs> we can discuss. Oh. I'm sure it works, right? So you get this number, which is precisely the dimensionality of this space, minus 1, as I want. So this sounds like the natural space to be used when you compute the scattering amplitudes. But how can you connect a space that has only dimension n minus 3 to a space that has dimension n times n minus 3 divided by 2, which is the space that, math that physicists will give you? Yes. Don't you have to identify the two points to stick them together? So then that cut a dimension down by one? Yeah, so no, the precisely is all, all into here. Okay. So this already becomes a fixed oh, mark point. Fixed. So that means that I only have two more degrees of freedom to fix two of these points. Yeah, in a sense, I added one and, and subtracted one. I shouldn't have. I, I could have done n minus two. Okay, so that's the question. How do we map or how do we connect our space Kn that has dimension n times n minus 3 over 2 to this space that has dimension n minus 3? Okay. So the answer actually, well, is um, it's not completely, I could say that it's natural, but it's not that natural. 
It's natural only after you found it and, and you think about it carefully. But uh, the answer or the hint comes from this matrix. What you do is to say, well, if you want something that connects the two spaces, you just don't want something that connects the two spaces at random, in random ways. You want something where one singularity in one space maps to the same or to the corresponding singularity in the other space. Remember that singularities are classified by subsets of the set of labels. So what we want is that every time we get P of E equal to zero, something happens on both spaces. So we can start with the simplest possible ones. When two, when you have a set that only contains, so let's start with a set that only contains two labels. Let's say that they are I and J. So when that element of the matrix SIJ goes to zero, what you want is a space that separates those two particles or those two mark points. So from the point of view of the remaining labels, it's as if these two mark points have gone to the same point. So you want something that links SIJ equal to zero to the space where sigma i and sigma j become the same point. So the proposal is to replace in this matrix every element SAB by SAB divided by the difference of the mark point locations. So that when this is equal to zero, these two points are forced to go to zero to keep the matrix from being singular. So if we do that, we get a new matrix, which I'm going to call A, has nothing to do with the amplitudes. Remember, for us, the amplitudes are the functions f. So this new matrix is a, function, is a, is a matrix that looks like this. Now you could say that I chose A because this new matrix is now anti-symmetric. So this matrix is anti-symmetric and the way I propose to connect the two spaces finally is to ask or require A of n to have the same property that this matrix had, that the sum of the columns is equal to zero. That's equivalent to saying that the vector 1, 1, 1, 1 belongs to the null space of this matrix n. So this matrix annihilates this vector. So it's exactly the same condition that this matrix satisfies, which I didn't write, but I could have written. Very good. So the resulting equations that you get from imposing that condition are equations that look like this. And asking for all these things to be zero is what is now known as the scattering equations. Okay. And this is something that was introduced with Song He and Ellis Yuan in 2013. So I'm not going to prove it because we don't have time for that. But these equations, their job is to map singularity to singularity. So every time the space of kinematic invariance develops a singularity, when you solve these equations, the mark points are sent to singularities of the corresponding space. All right. Now, there is something else that this object does when you impose these equations. This object also develops another null vector, 
which happens to be the product of all, it's not the product, it's a vector constructed from the location of all the punctures. It also is also annihilated by this matrix once this is true. That means that this matrix had one null vector, and this one has two. So the null space has two dimensions. And if we want to define the determinant of this matrix, or we could define the Fafian of the matrix if we wanted to, the Fafian of this matrix n, a n, is zero. But it turns out that if you eliminate the i-th and the j-th row from the matrix, you could still define something that is non-zero, of course, if n is even. So this is, again, part of the same as i. And if you divide by the difference of the puncture locations, you happen to get an invariant of this matrix, which you can guess how I'm going to call. Just by looking how I call this one, you could guess that I call this the Fafian prime of the matrix A. N. All right. Now there is yet a third object that I can define, another matrix that naturally plays a role in this uh, in this setup, which is the matrix obtained by taking derivatives of this equation with respect to the puncture location. So this is going to be the matrix whose elements are the derivative of this equation with respect to the puncture locations. So this matrix, I'm not going to write what this looks like, because it's the sum of all this with a minus sign. So I'm just going to write the next ones, just for amusement, because it's as if we're introducing more and more powers of the differences of the puncture locations every time. And this matrix now has core rank. What do you think? So the first one had core rank 1. The next one had core rank 2. And this one, of course, no choice but to have core rank 3. And the null space spanned by this vector this vector and this vector. And needless to say, I'm going to define something like I, I, I've done for the, for the other ones. So again, an aside for the moment is that I could define the determinant of this matrix, which is of course zero, but I can remove i, j, and k and divide by what is known as the van der Monde determinant of this, of the three i, j, and k rows that I can extract from this matrix and obtain something that is an invariant of the metric and is independent of the choice that I'm making. All right, so we're almost done, almost ready to, actual con to actually construct an amplitude. But before we do that, let's ask the following question. Could these equations come from Could this vector of equations come from some potential? Well, you would say, well, it looks, the equations look very simple. So surely, there must be some function whose gradient gives you those equations. And the answer is yes. So in order to do that, let me use SL2C to fix three mark points, A, B, and C, any three that you want. I'm going to set this one to 0, this one to 1, and this one to infinity. In fact, I didn't have to use the full power of SL2C. I could have used SL2R. And you will see why I want to do that. The reason I'm allowed to, do, to change SL2C for SL2R is that I'm going to prove to you 
that there is a region in kinematic space where all the solutions to these equations are strictly real. So we can restrict to the real locus of the complex version of this model space. So we can restrict ourselves. We're going to be able to restrict ourselves to this space. And these are going to be, more, moreover, all the solutions will correspond to the location to the case where all the mark points lie between the interval 0 and 1. So in order to do that, I'm going to write down for you what this function is. And I'll let you check that this is true. So this function happens to be minus the sum from a, b. Now we only have n minus 3 punctures that are free. The other three were fixed by our SL to C degree of freedom, s a, b log of sigma a minus sigma b minus the sum of a a a we have log of sigma a minus the sum of s a b log of 1 minus sigma a a from 1 to n minus 3. This is the function. Now the sigmas are restricted to lie on the, real, on the real line. So let me first prove to you why every solution has to give you something that lies on the interval. Assume that one of the, part, one of the punctures is outside of the interval. So what's going to happen? This potential is a potential for point particles on a line that is repulsive. Every time you have two particles that want to get close to each other, they are repelled from each other not only from each other, but also from 0 and 1. So 0 and 1 are like particles that are stuck there, and they repel everybody. So if you put somebody on the other side of one of them, say on the other side of 1, this particle is going to be repelled by these ones, and it's going to move off to infinity. And it's going to collide with the particle that we have there, which is something that is not allowed in the space of solutions. So the particles must be here. They repel each other. So just give me any way of sprinkling n minus 3 points in here, and I'm guaranteed to find one solution. You see why? Because no matter what happens, no matter the strength. Oh, I forgot. Maybe that's the reason why you're, you look surprised. Everything that I'm saying is true. If you assume that these numbers are all positive, so they have to be positive numbers, then everything that I'm saying is correct. So all the interactions between these particles are repulsive. So every way in which I can sprinkle the particles here give me one solution to those equations. So there is a bijection between the space of solutions to these equations and the, and the permutation of n minus 3 elements. That means that we have n minus 3 factorial solutions to these equations. And they are all real. Where you get? Yes. Excellent question. Very, very good. So let's count. How many SABs do I have here? We have this set, which is n minus 3 times n. So this one doesn't include a and b. So it's n minus 3 times n minus 4 over 2. We have n minus 3 here and n minus 3 there. So we have 2 times n minus 3. And now, hopefully, this thing is the same as this, right? So if I put it together, what do I get? So I'm just counting how many S's appear of the big matrix. How many S's will appear in here? So if I put this thing together, again, you put it in Mathematica. So these, these four cancels with this four. Um, Sorry, I'm adding. So 
So I'm counting how many S's I have. I have this many from here. I have this many over this many, n minus 3 from here and n minus 3 from here. That's why I had 2 times that. I multiplied and divided by 2. And then I get this thing. So it turns out that the S's that appear here are a, are a basis of the space of kinematic invariance. You look surprised, but remember, nowhere you see here SAC. These entries don't appear. And also, you don't see SAB. You don't see SAC and SVC. These are entries in the big matrix that are not being used in the definition of this potential function. These ones are negative. Some of them would be negative. But you agree that the ones that appear here are n times n minus 3 over 2, elements of the big matrix. So I can take them to be a basis, and I can choose them to be whatever I want. In particular, I can take them all to be positive. And these other ones will be negative. Since you are still not convinced, let me just be more explicit. Imagine you have the matrix Kn. You put A, B, and C here. The entries that appear here are only those in this set. Everything here and here doesn't enter in this definition. OK. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You didn't get to choose. Oh, this is very good, very good. So, yeah, we don't have experimental friends, so that's not a problem. No, um, I mean, if you want to, yeah. No, it, indeed, yeah. that's true. No, but I'm going to use this space in order to construct my rational function. So I'm cheating. After I construct a rational function, I can analytically continue to any, to any region. Yeah. Very good. So now, uh, so let's see what do I want to use. OK, so I guess I've convinced you that there are n minus 3 factorial solutions. Uh, I want to get this. And we definitely don't need this anymore. So we're almost ready. So with this construction, what I've shown is that we have n minus 3 factorial solutions. So the following formula is actually well defined. So let me introduce the integral from 0 to 1 of a from 1 to n minus 3. And these are going to be these n minus 3 mark points. times the product again from a1 to n minus 3 of delta of these equations. So these are delta functions that impose the support of the equations. These are the n minus 3 variables. They are only restricted to be from 0 to 1. So this formula is strictly well defined. And I can integrate here something that depends possibly on this, on the position of the that depends on the positions of the mark points, and it could also depend on the entries of the matrix of kinematic data. So the proposal that we made in 2013 is that this object, let's call it B mu n, is the natural measure to construct the scattering amplitudes. And it encodes, or is supposed to encode, all the information about the singularities that the amplitude is supposed to have. So everything else, all the other details about your theory, what kind of particles you have, what speed do they carry, is all in this part. But the engine that produces 
the singularities of the amplitude and takes care of everything that has to be done with the amplitude is through the integration over this modular space. Now, this integration is trivially done. I just show you what it is. So, what is it? We just sum over all the solutions. The Jacobian is nothing but the determinant prime of the matrix phi that we constructed before, evaluated at the sigmas given by the solution that you chose, times this integrand evaluated at that particular solution for this. So, this is a proposal for any amplitude. And now we can end the talk, or the last part of the talk, is to tell you what theories we know how to construct in this way, but at least a partial set of the theories we know how to construct in this way. So we already have the tools to construct one of them, and it's here. Consider this matrix and replace so here is the first theory, theory number one. We have the integral over this modal space, and that's a fancy way of saying just perform this integral, of the integrand is going to be the Fafian prime of the matrix An to the fourth power. That sounds like a crazy choice, well, but after all, I have this matrix. I have to do something with it. And it turns out that this object, and don't ask me why, because I don't quite know, computes the complete three-level S matrix of the following theory. It's a theory of a scalar field that has an interacting Lagrangian, an interaction Lagrangian of the following form. It has an infinite number of vertices, actually. And many, many derivatives. This is a matrix where i and j go from 1 to m minus 1. Now, if you are like me, you probably hadn't seen this theory before. When we found this object, we had to go around and ask people, have you ever seen an S-matrix that looks like this? Have you ever seen something that looks like this? Until we finally found somebody who had. And they told us about this theory. And this theory is called the Galilean theory. So we were not very happy, because it wasn't one of the famous theories, but still. Better than nothing. So the next step, or the next theory that we can construct is the following. Theory two. Now we take our f to be the integral over this model space. But we now construct something else. We construct something that has the same transformation under SL2R as this object had, so that the integral will be well defined and independent of the choices that we made of which three mark points were frozen. So by just that requirement, you would realize that there is a natural choice that one can make which is the product of the differences of puncture of mark point locations chosen in a chain that defines a planar ordering. Well, you shouldn't be surprised at planar ordering center, because yesterday all the talk was about that. But only one of them, one copy of this object, will not do the job, so you have to square it. And this is an integral that is well defined and independent of the choice of the three mark points that we, we have frozen. And this thing turns out to be something more respectable. Well, respectable in the sense that uh, I, I, I'm not offending anyone. I'm just, uh, I'm just saying a theory that is 
something that we all know, or at least that, uh, that we have studied. This will correspond to the following Lagrangian, the following interacting Lagrangian. It's a standard phi cube theory. So the Lagrangian is just a standard phi cube theory, except that you have many, many, many such fields interacting through a cubic coupling. So how many fields you have? Well, we're going to introduce these indices and contract the indices with the Fs, our structure constants of SUN. And what is this supposed to be computing? Well, there is a planar ordering. So this is supposed to compute a scattering amplitude in this theory where I've chosen a planar ordering for my Feynman diagrams. So this computes the sum over all graphs that belong to some planar ordering determined by the ordering that I've chosen here. So these are Feynman diagrams or rooted trees, binary rooted trees that are planar or can be drawn on the plane where the leaves will have the ordering 1 through n. And what do we have here? Well, the standard Feynman propagators for a cubic theory. So it would be 1 over the product and finally, so I had to make it here. If anything happened, I had to make it here. The product over all the edges of the graph of PE. Now you see the reason for the notation E for the subsets that define the singularities. So this was very, very important to make it here before the end of the talk. Otherwise, you wouldn't have known what the, the reason for the E was. It turns out that this integral encodes all the information about this sum of Feynman diagrams. Okay. And last theory that I want to introduce is the following. So if I told you that the game was simply to come out with integrants that had the correct transformation on the SL to C, I've given you two such integrants. So you could, out of these two, you could make even a third one, which is a mixture of the previous two. So you can take one piece of this. Times one piece of the other one that you cannot see now. Maybe you could. Let's see. No, the other way. Ah. From here, you take two powers of this. Square. And this has the correct SL to C weight to be integrated properly against this measure. And this one computes for you the S matrix of the following Lagrangian. So for, in order to introduce this, I have to define, to introduce a matrix constructed out of scalar fields contracted with Hermitian n by n matrices. These are Hermitian matrices. This operator is unitary. So the theory that I'm going to write here is the following. This also looks like a crazy theory, but it's not. It's something that has appeared in physics. This is a theory that describes particles called pions. So you see that there is something strange here. So you can take the theory that defines pions and double up this part of the, of the interaction of the, of the formula and get particles that are called galileons. Or you can take this part of the formula and square it and get Phi cube theories. So this must resemble, or it should remind you, of a statement that people usually make that Young Mills, or that gravity is the square of, gra of Young Mills. So how could that come from? Well, the reason is that we know how to replace this 
by another object that gives you Jack Mills theory. This third theory would be Jack Mills. This whole thing can be replaced by something that gives you Jack Mills. And I'll end the talk by simply saying that if you take replace this by two copies of the object that gives Jan Mills, you get gravity. Thank you. The answer is, I don't know. No, I haven't been able to reproduce all physical theories. And no, there is no prescription. So that's the reason why um, we constructed theories and ended up knocking on the doors of everyone we knew to ask if they had seen some metrics that looks like this. Uh, it would be spectacular to have a prescription so that somebody gives you the Lagrangian and you can come out with this object. Some fantasy, since I'm being recorded, doesn't matter, right? So a fantasy could be that there is some sort of localization procedure on the path integral that will give you this formula directly. Now, you could ask, why did I call this unexpected structures? Why is it unexpected? Well, this modular space appears in string theory. So that's very natural in string theory. But from string theory, we know that the particle limit, quantum field theory, should appear only as a limit. And here I'm using the interior of the model space as if these were big, fat strings. So it's somewhat unexpected that this is the, the, the relevant space for this, uh, for this description. <laughs>